And I know that you tend to sit down, which is natural. You know, now this is, we are like programmed years for years that, okay, after the word of God, let's sit down. Uh, but remember that uh, I'm thinking that we need to really allow the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen? Amen. So we have this hymn, and I would encourage you to just stretch your hands. Remember when we stand in the presence of God to honor God? It's a gesture of receiving something from God. All right? It is, there is no magic in stretching your hand. It's just a gesture before the Lord. So if some of you are thinking, I'm really uh, not into this, you don't have to be into this or out of this. Just stretch. Just stretch. As we clap to, uh, to appreciate something, and, and we just stretch our hands and say, Lord, I'm here as a recipient. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. So you're not doing anything wrong if you stretch your hands. Let's, let's uh, sing this together. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Please be seated. And the reason I did this because this, the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amen? amen? Yes. You are all doing good with amen. So when I say amen, I'm asking, do you agree with that? The Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's why we ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate our mind so that we will be transformed as God wants us to be transformed. Amen? Amen. All right, I think we are ready to receive the Word of God now. And the title for today is Christ Jesus Tells Us Why Not to Worry. Now, I'm not going to take much time to define what is worry or what is not worry right in the beginning. We will go into that Greek word, of course. But I am sure that everyone sitting here has some level of experience with worry and anxiety. Right? So this word worry and anxiety is not a foreign language to us. It's been part of our life if we have lived in this life long enough. We all know that we worry, we get anxious. So this is something uh, that has become part of our life and we are very familiar with this worry and anxiety, these words. And when you look at the definition that we have uh, from Matthew chapter 6, Today, this comes from the Greek word which is used is merimonete, but it comes from the word merimonao, which means it describes worry and anxiety as to be divided, destructed, to go to pieces because you are being pulled into many directions. So now you can understand from the Greek language when uh, Jesus was saying, do not worry. He might be speaking Aramaic, but when the writers were writing in Greek, that's what they meant, that worry and anxiety deplete all the strength that you have. As if you're running in different directions, you do not have the courage and strength uh, to face the situation or circumstances uh, that has come before you and now you're worried, you are weak, you are divided, you are distracted, you do not have energy, you are peaceless, restless, and so on and so forth. I'm sure I'm making sense to some of you at least when you think about the word worry and what does it do to you. I'm not sure what is your strategy to handle worry. We all have our own strategies, right? Some people will go to psychiatrists uh, to find some solution and mental health counseling and this and that. And we have our own ways of doing things. A man named David worried all the time. 
And I heard from someone, somebody told me, I can't recall the person's name. She said to me, I worry all the time. Is there anyone who says that? I worry all the time. Maybe some of you. I worry all the time. So there was a man named David. He worried all the time. And then it was really taking a toll on his mental health, physical health. You know, it's all connected, as you know. So he, is, he was really in a bad shape. And somebody suggested him, why don't you hire someone to worry for you? Have you ever hired a person to worry for you? No? Okay. So David liked the idea, and he said, I'm going to hire a person who will be worrying for me. And he found a man who agreed to take all his worries. So he had a hired worker to worry for him. Now this hired man, first day on his job, was settling the salary, and David said to him that I'm going to pay you $200,000 a year for taking care of all my worries. And he said, yes, I'll do that, $200,000. Who, who doesn't want that money? And the next question, uh, the, the first question that this man who was hired to worry asked the boss, David, where will you get $200,000 per year? And he said, I don't know, that's your worry. So that is his strategy, how to tackle worry. I don't know what is your strategy. But we do hear most of the time or all the time that there has not been a day when we did not hear that I don't worry, I don't have an anxiety. We may have covered it up different ways, but we all know that we go through our life worrying and being anxious. Even when Jesus says, do not worry, yeah, that doesn't sit with us. Why? Because it is almost like do not breathe. Do not worry. You will say, mm, you don't know what you're talking about. It's almost like do not breathe, right? That has become so much part of us. If somebody says to you, do not worry, you begin to worry. What do you mean by that? I don't really get it. Some people, when they don't have anything to worry about, they begin to worry why I don't have anything to worry about. So they are still with worry. Even when Jesus says, do not worry, it sounds almost like do not breathe because it has become so much part of us. We think that this scripture or this way of saying is a good saying, but I'm not sure how much it's relevant to my life. Maybe God does not really understand what's going on in my life. Or the person who is telling me, don't worry, they don't know what I'm going through, right? Like those are the things naturally we respond back with. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know my life. You don't know what I am going through right now. And you say, don't worry. It doesn't sit well with me, even if it's the word of God. Because we have bought into this. Don't worry means don't breathe. We can't live without breathing. Same way people think we can't live without worrying. However, the word of God continues to tell us, do not worry. Now, how do we understand this when we live in this life? How do we balance that off? Here we have all the worries and anxieties and daily life concerns and all those things going on. Now, I want to make a slight difference here and concern something that you act on. You have a plan to do something and you, you, know, you will see how to tackle that. You make some uh, action plan. Even when Jesus was using, look at the birds of the air. They do not worry, right? God is feeding them. The birds of the air are not just sitting and opening their mouth and God is feeding. They're going out. What Jesus is saying, you are designed to tackle, to take care of that because I have provision for you. When you start moving in that direction, how I want you to move, you will be fine. So that's where the worry, anxiety, and the concern part comes. But when it comes to worry and anxiety, in the context, it is basically that you have, you have become slave to worry, as if worry has become your master. You know, if you look at the context, you will find, probably I can just uh, sh show you real quick. When you read verse 25, which was the text, mess, text for us today from 25 to 34, the word 25 starts with 
therefore, and therefore is always almost like a summary statement or a connection between the previous section of the scripture. Are you following what I'm saying? And Jesus was talking about you cannot serve two masters. Now, he was specifically talking about you can't serve money and you cannot serve me together. But the implications are basically, why do you want to serve money? Because you're worried about your life. That if I have enough, then I'm safe. Are you following where I'm going with this? So we, we are taking that context and the implications uh, as we are going into this worry part of the sermon and the theme of the sermon. So we have our own way of tackling what to do with worry. Now, let me just throw another one. J. Arthur Rank was a British industrialist. I will not go more in detail about him. Was born in 1888 and died in 1972. You can Google which J. Arthur uh, Rank I was, I'm talking about. He had rather a, a different way of tackling his worries. Because he realized in his life, oh, by the way, he was also a Methodist. A devout Methodist. He had a different way of uh, tackling worry in his life. He analyzed what's happening in his life. He thought that he's pushing all his worries away, but somehow his worries are slipping into his life from different directions. So coming in his life, and he realized that he cannot handle worries in his life. So he came up with the plan. Maybe he talked with God and he said, God, this is what I'm going to do. You help me. He came up with the plan. He made a, a worry day box that I'm going to do all my worries on. Can you read? Wednesday. Or a people who are sitting in the front rows, backbenchers, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he made a box called Wednesday worry box. And he put it on his desk. And he said that any time during the week, if I have a worry creep up, I'm going to write it out, insert it in the box, and I'm going to open that box when? On Wednesday. So he's, he didn't hire someone. He knew that doesn't work. So what he did, he had a Wednesday worry box. How many of you have a Wednesday worry box at home? No? All right, maybe you want one. Maybe you decide which day you want to worry. Because we all know that worry can take a toll. And uh, so what he did, he had a Wednesday worry box anytime. Worries during the week crop up. He will write it out, put in the Wednesday box. And this is what he discovered. Listen carefully. He found out that on Wednesday when he opened the worry box, one-third of the worries were worth worrying about and also he could manage them well. But all the other worries that he had were automatically being resolved or some way or the other they were not worried anymore. Did you see what was going on? One third of the things that he thought could be just faced without really being anxious about. Now, that was J. Arthur. Now, somebody else came up with some kind of statistical data or, or, or idea. I don't know what was the source, but that's what I read. He said 40% on, an, on average, in an average person's life, an average person worries 40% of the things that will not happen in life or very little, slightest chance that will happen. How many percentage? 40%. Then he said, 30% things an average person worries about is related to the past that you cannot change. <laughs> there you have your 70%. Then he talked about 12% an average person worries about how other people are critical of him or her which is not true. And then he said, there are 10%, on average, a person, 10% of the worries are about health, which gets worse with stress and worry. Remaining 8%, 
He said 8% are really some real issues that can be handled and faced. So now I gave you three, four different scenarios how people looked at worry and anxiety and still as we come to the scripture, the scripture says, do not worry. Now, how do we handle? Can we hire a person? How many of you are willing to hire a person? <laughs> Maybe none of us. <laughs> because we know that doesn't work. Are we willing to create a Wednesday box? I don't know how many of you will go through that trouble either. How many of you are going to analyze it? I'm not sure. But why don't we just simplify our life as God wants us to simplify? Amen? What did he say? Do not worry. Have you heard this song? Don't worry, be happy. You know, there is a vast difference between don't worry and be happy. Something in the middle needs to be present to sustain that statement. If my computer crashes and I'm not a tech-savvy person, what will happen? I will worry. But if a tech-savvy person comes to me and said, I'm going to take care of it. What happens to my worry? It's handled, right? So something has to come in between don't worry or the concern that we have and the resolution for that, but someone has to have that kind of uh, uh, the gap filled so that you and I will not worry. And again, the word of God tells, I am there for you. I am there for you. Do not worry. And that's why, you know, the song that we sang today, Good, Good Father, who knows all our needs even before we say a word. Even in our prayer that was, before we say a word, God knows all about us. He knows us. If he has planned eternity for us, then he, will he not care for us in this short span of life? Amen? Come on, give me a loud one. Amen? Yes. Now, here is what we are going to do in the remaining time that I have with you. We are going to look at the word of God and take with us something that the word of God directly tells us and also look at the real life situations in the word of God, in the biblical stories when there were crises, things to be worried about, things to be anxious about, so we are going to look at real life situations and circumstances and we are going to look into the word of God, what God is saying to us that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Basically means seek God's face first. All the other things, who is going to take care? God will take care. You keep your focus very clear. Let your mind, your focus be on Jesus Christ, on God, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen? Yes. So I'm going to go through real quick five situations and circumstances that, we, that I observe in the scripture and take you through that so that we are able to be sustained, not just a statement, don't worry. And how can we be at peace and be happy in the middle because something is going to come that will sustain us. And that's where we are going today. And the first thing, first scenario uh, I wanted to say to you is related to the faith that I want you to understand. Whenever Jesus said about worry, he always brought faith into that. Even as we read today, Matthew 6, 30, what does it say? When Jesus talks to them about how God feeding the birds, and how God is clothing the flowers, the grass. What does he say? If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? First of all, we need to understand from the scripture, the moment we ride on this worry car or vehicle, whatever you want to say, we are getting into our faith crisis, whether you like it or not, because that's what Jesus did, right? Didn't he say this to you? Oh, you of little faith. Jesus had a direct 
correlation. Worry and faith has a direct correlation. So if we are worrying, what we are doing, basically, we are not trusting God. We are failing to move forward in our lives, not trusting in God. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm not questioning your faith. Who is? God, Jesus himself, is questioning our faith because he, he clearly made a correlationship between our faith and worry. If you're worrying, that means you are losing somewhere on your faith. Now, I just want to give you a pause here. Now, this is nothing to do with your salvation, okay? There is a difference between believing in Jesus for our salvation, which is, I think, probably all of you will say, I believe in Jesus. I don't have any doubt about that. I do not worry about my salvation or my eternal life, right? Amen? All of us, we are sitting. But what Jesus is saying is about day-to-day -day life. Why? Because he said that I have come so that you may have life, life in abundance. He's not talking about the eternal life. We all know that we have eternal life. We believe in Jesus. What he's talking about is the abundant life, the quality of life. Let me just put it this way. Worry significantly affects the quality of life how we live out our lives. And God, who wants us, his children, to enjoy the gift of life, that's where he brings that correlation, that oh, you of little faith. Now, I want to uh, also bring out to you one other scripture where we see in 627 that Jesus talks about that anxiety and worry is futile. One, it is related to your faith. Second, Jesus tells that this is useless. How many of us want to do some useless stuff? No one. Jesus wants to tell us that it is useless. When you read 627, if you have your Bibles, I don't have it on the screen, Jesus said, how many of you are able to add an hour to your life by worrying? How many of you? He said, none. So what you're doing by worrying? Nothing. It's useless to worry. So from the scripture I told you, one, it is useless. Two, it is directly related to our faith. And both these things I took out from the scripture. If you want to make a note, 627, Matthew 627, which Jesus says that why are you worrying when you cannot do anything with that? This is useless. Second, verse 30, if you continue to worry, you are demonstrating lack of faith. There is a correlationship between worrying and lack of faith. Now, George Muller said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Shall I repeat? George Muller, great man, with great testimony. Again, don't have the luxury of time to go through his life. The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Famed E. Stanley Jones, one of my favorite authors and missionaries, Methodist missionary, he, so, he writes, I am inwardly fashioned for faith. Now, why would God tell us, don't worry, have faith? The reason for that, because that's, that's how he has wired us to function. He has not wired us to live in worry and anxiety because that is detrimental to our health. And anything is, which is detrimental to our health in physically or uh, spiritually or psychologically, in particular how God wired us, God says don't do that worry part. I am inwardly fashioned for faith, not for fear. Fear is not my native land. Faith is. I am so made that worry and anxiety are sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear, doubt, and anxiety. In anxiety and worry, my being is gasping for breath. 
these are not my native air, but in faith and confidence I breathe freely, these are my native air. Beautifully said. We are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, brain cell and soul, for faith and not for fear. God made us that way. To live by worry is to live against reality. And this is E. Stanley Jones. And no wonder why Jesus wants to take us to higher reality. Our life situations and circumstances are real, right? We do go through circumstances, situations, anxieties and worries kind of situations and circumstances. I'm not saying and Christ is not saying that those are not real thing. What he's saying that you're not made for that. I have created you to live under the shelter of my wings. Amen. In my hands, you are the apple of my eye. That's the word of God. So, do not worry. That's why Jesus said, I'm taking you to the higher reality where you can live. I'm calling you to do that. So, now I'm going to take you real quick in five situations and circumstances that we saw. And maybe we can relate to some of these. Even if we do not relate to some of those situations and circumstances in the scripture, at least we can think about this and understand how people in the scripture tackled worry and how Christ or God asked them to tackle worry. When you look at Old Testament, Isaiah 37, I'm not going to read it. You can make a note. Isaiah 37 is the time where King Hezekiah, he's the king of Judah, he had crisis in his life and his, for his country. We all know that how Russia, superpower, tried to decimate Ukraine. It's almost similar situation right here. And if you want to see historically, it is 701 BC in the history. And where Assyria is a, is a rising superpower at the time. Assyria was a rising superpower and King Hezekiah, their golden days are over with King David and King Solomon. And King Hezekiah is down the line among the kings of Judah. He is being threatened by Assyria to surrender. What does he do? He takes the ladder, which is full of threat. He goes to the temple of God, and he does not talk to people. He does not go to Egypt. He does not go anywhere. He comes to the house of God. When worry strikes you, where do you go? To God. He goes, and then he lays that ladder of threat before God. So when worry strikes you, what do you do? Run to God. Amen. Run to God and spread it out before God. Stretch yourself before God and say, God, you help me. And God who is faithful, he will take care of you. Those who call upon his name, they are coming under the shelter of the most high God. Amen. The second one I want to tell you, Elisha and his servant. Again, I'm not going to take the time. You can make a note. This is another time when as Aramians, Aramians surrounded, Aramian army surrounded the prophet, uh, prophet Elisha and his servant. To cut the story short, Elisha was at peace, but his servant, he was trembling with fear. And he was thinking, now how we will escape the army, the enemy has surrounded us. Elisha prayed to the Lord. He said, Lord, open the eyes of my servant. When the Lord opened the servant, servant's eye, verse 17, you see there, then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So the reality of enemies surrounded them, of course, that is on the ground. What do we see? But God's forces... The spiritual forces are surrounding Elisha and his servant. So what do we see here? Ask God, God, open my eye. When you worry, asking God, open my eyes so that I can see what you are doing in my life. Amen? 
Because if he promised you that he's going to take care of you and you're not able to see and you're worrying like his servant, Elisha is at peace. Why? Because his spiritual eyes are opened. Many a times we run into worries because our spiritual eyes are closed. All we see what is happening in real world around us. That's all we see. We walk by faith, not just merely by sight. Amen? First thing, go to God. Second thing, ask God to keep your, your, open your spiritual eyes and keep it, keep it remain open. Don't close those. The third thing I just want to say to you, what Jesus said again, we, this is a very popular story. When Jesus was sleeping in the boat, the boat was in trouble, right? His disciples began to worry, and they said, we are drowning, Jesus, you are sleeping. What did Jesus do? He calmed the sea. He's the Lord over all the, uh, all the laws of this nature. Amen? He's Lord over everything. He calmed the sea, and he also said to them, oh, you of little faith. Now, you know, it is, it is difficult to remember all that when we are in trouble. But then when should we remember? Only when we are in trouble, right? Remember, third thing, that Jesus is the captain of your ship. One, when worry strikes you, run to God. Don't run anywhere else. Two, keep your spiritual eyes open. Three, remember, Jesus is the captain of your ship. When worry strikes you, number four, what you have to do? Look at what Paul and Silas are doing. They preached the gospel and they ended up in prison because Christians were persecuted at the time. What Paul and Silas were doing in Acts chapter 16, instead of worrying, being anxious, the scripture says they were praising God and sharing the good news inside the prison. Many of us, when we are in trouble, what we, what we do, we worry how to get out of this, right? Instead of that, what they're saying, God already, know, already knows where I am. Let me just praise him and worship him. And what happened? The shackles broke. The shackles broke as they were worshiping and praying. When you are surrounded by worrisome situations, start praising God. Start worshiping God. And the shackles of worries are going to come out loose. Amen? Come on, you became weak. Amen? I'm almost done. This is number four. Lastly, if you, are, if you want to understand, remember, popular scripture, and we know that in all things God works out for the good of all those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And if you want to go directly to the scripture, these are some indirect face uh, scenarios. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 says, do not be anxious about some things. Correct me. Do not be anxious about? Yeah, anything means that is all. But in all things, with prayer, with thanksgiving, Bring your request to the Lord and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. How about 1 Peter 5, 7? Cast all your anxiety unto him for he cares for you. So we see the scripture is filled with real life situations where people were in crisis they were worrying, but at the same time, how they tackled worry. They didn't make a Wednesday box when they need some solution on Monday. Amen? So don't wait for Wednesday. God is our ever-present help. I gave you five things. First, do not worry. What do you do? Go to God and spread out your worries before God. Two, Keep your spiritual eyes open. Three, know Jesus is the captain of your ship. Four, 
Pray, praise and worship when you are surrounded with worry, some situation. Five, know that God will work out all things for good for those who love him. Now is the test. One, run to God, go to God. Two, keep your spiritual eyes open. Three, Jesus is the captain of our ship. Four, praise him, worship him. Let the worry take care of itself. Five, know that you are loved by God and he's going to work out all things for good. And when you put it together, <laughs> you punch worry in the face. That's the only time I can tell you about punching, okay? Otherwise, you have to turn the other cheek, by the way. <laughs> but, but it says that resist the enemy and he will flee from you. Worry is your enemy. He's not your friend. Don't let this useless thing occupy your mind and run your life. Bring all this together and go. Can you do this? Don't pull your muscles, okay? And don't go to doctor afterwards. Let's, let's do it together, these five things, and say, worry, go out. Okay, let us rise. Let us repent from worrying because we know that the scripture is very clear the core relationship between worry and our faith. And repent from this useless thing when you can do many useful things for the glory of God. Worry will take away the strength you have for today for God's glory. Just focus on that. Just come to God and say, God, forgive me. And resurrender your life to Jesus to live that life that he has designed for you. We are not denying the real life situations, but we know the higher reality now that our faith and trust in Christ is the oil for our machinery of life. Come Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves into your hands. Now let us sing this closing hymn.